Well, hello and welcome to Insight with Political Tours and Beyond the Headlines. John Kampfner, the political journalist and author, has a new book out about Germany. The title alone has been enough to wind up people on both sides of the North Sea. It's called Why the Germans Do It Better here in the UK. Some of us don't like to be told we're doing, we're doing worse than Germany. And in Germany, apparently, they find that kind of praise all rather worrying. Hello, John. And welcome to Insight. Hi there, Nicholas. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a great book. Here it is. Um, the focus, is it, it, focus of it is why and how Germany has managed to bring about political stability and economic success over the past 75 years. I guess on the face of it, it's something that most of us are aware of. But John, how did you get the idea to frame it this way? Um, where did you get the idea for the book and why, why write it now? I was a foreign correspondent twice in Germany, first in the sleepy former capital of Bonn um, back in the mid 80s, 85 to 86. Um, then I was uh, sent to uh, East Berlin, where I was uh, for the British newspaper, the Daily Telegraph, its first correspondent to the German Democratic Republic. And very quickly, I was its last correspondent to the GDR as well. So I was there um, living in East Berlin, although I had full access to the West, um, really experiencing the denouement, the, the final part, the final throes of communist life in mm. East Germany, the wall coming down, the pretty chaotic, but at the same time, remarkably stable transition in that year to reunification. And as soon as reunification happened, I was then shipped off to Moscow, where I saw communism collapse there. So there's probably, and now I'm back in Britain and seeing this country collapse here. But that's, uh, that's for another part of this uh, discussion. And I suppose, as some German friends and interlocutors have said to me, this is as much a story about my own country, um, a lament for a country, I think, in to a large degree, I've lost, as it is a praise for Germany. And in a way, they are, even though what's curious is that the two countries are actually quite similar in so many ways. One, the plight of one is a mirror I think of the qualified, not unqualified, qualified success of the other, but the success of Germany in the last 30 years, the theme that will develop, I think has been remarkable. And so I think it was the, just the sense of post 2016 populism in the UK with Brexit, in the United States with Trump and so many other places around the world in, in Central Europe, uh, in Latin America and elsewhere, maybe look at, well, actually, where are things comparatively stable mm. in spite of crises? And which country or countries can really be our beacon for the future? And I alighted on the place that I used to live in. OK, so it's that word stability that really catches um, my attention. And so you're, you're the, the, the idea for the book, you obviously have got the background, the history of working there, some of you know very well, but it's that sense of why are we so unstable? How is somebody else managing to cope with this in a better way and could cope with our, you know, the, the plights of the times? Yeah, I mean, two things to say on that. One is stability can also sound deathly dull. Um, and in some ways, that is also the German story. Um, a lot of uh, mm. Germany in the last 30 years has just been getting getting it done, presiding over um, a strong but stable economy and a political structure that notwithstanding its faults, I think is the envy of pretty much everywhere. But also back on this, on this mirror, this reflection thing with the UK, Germans have always looked at Britain as being, yes, a bit old fashioned, yes, a bit hidebound, but essentially pragmatic people, people who never um, swerved from one extreme to another. Um, and they hugely respected Britain for that and huge groundswell of affection, much of which has not gone. Um, and they look at our predicament now uh, much more in sorrow than in, than in anger. And they just ask me again and again, why, oh, why, what on earth has happened to your country? 
Okay, well, I want to come back to you on your analysis of what's going on here, that necessity for the comparison a bit later on. But just, just to sort of, um, detail a bit more, give a, provide a bit more detail about what's in the book, you look at Germany's relationship with the Holocaust, something you argue that it's come to terms with whilst continually trying to address its lessons. Um, you talk, as you say, about its political framework, its renowned economic success. Uh, but the figure that sort of caught my attention and I think is a very good way of sort of illustrating German stability is, is Muti, is Angela Merkel. Can you talk about why you focused on her? I met her um, in mm. the start of 1990 in the old Palace de Republique, the palace of, of uh, the, it was the uh, Volkskammer, the People's Chamber, as it was then, the East German Parliament. It was also a bit of a sort of social centre and there was quite a nice cafe by, by GDR standards. Um, she was uh, an advisor to the um, GDR's uh, fledgling and very brief uh, democratic leadership. This was so after the wall had come down, but before reunification. Uh, she struck me as very bright, very grounded, not particularly remarkable. Uh, it was a meeting, you know, like any journalist or politician has dozens of these sorts of meetings a week. And it didn't, you know, if only I'd sort of, you know, kept in touch, you mm. know, if only I had known that 15 years later, um, she would have uh, climbed to becoming Chancellor, which in itself was remarkable because she was absolutely unqualified in German terms for the job. Uh, she was a woman. Um, she was a divorcee, she was a scientist, um, all these things they had absolutely uh, not had before. Um, uh, Helmut Kohl, who was absolutely her sponsor, her mentor all the way through, but he couldn't resist calling her Das Mädchen, the girl, sort of mm. my girl. Um, uh, and. But then when Cole got mired in a financial corruption scandal around the time of the millennium, she uh, verily stuck the knife into him and made sure that he was booted out of the way. But even then, nobody thought that she, or even when she did become the, her party, the CDU's chancellor candidate, nobody thought she would actually get the job or that she would last. Yeah. And the fact that she's now going to be if she survives to the end of next year, the longest serving, serving post-war German chancellor, and they've all served a pretty long time, 16 plus years is extraordinary. She is going to go out on uh, a comparative high, which again, for any long serving politician is unusual um, because of her handling of so many crises. If you think of the second half of unification you think of the financial crisis and the debt crisis that ensued the refugee crisis which i do think is perhaps the most remarkable chapter in germany's recent history and now covid where they have been out there in terms of the way they've handled not just the narrow uh, but vital health challenges but the broader societal challenges as well yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, you put her up there, uh, at least with, you know, um, Ardena, Willy Brandt, um, Cole. I mean, she's, you know, Germany produces big statesmen, but she's, you know, right up there um, um, among the best in your estimation. Um, let's talk a bit more about the migrant crisis, because that really nearly was the end of her chancellorship. It was highly controversial. And also, I'm interested in, in you know, migration itself. Here in Britain, we've taken in very few migrants. Um, and it's seen as a, as a sort of political poison, yet she's managed to survive. In many ways, the migration stories, if you put Britain and France in one bucket and um, Germany in another, they've sort of flipped over. So Britain and France, because of their colonial legacies, in Britain's case with Windrush and with the Salvation Continent, and in France's case with the Maghreb, um, essentially, and with West Africa too, um, took in a huge amount of people uh, from the 40s and the 50s into the 60s, becoming multi, whether they liked it or not, becoming multicultural, multiracial societies with all the good that that entails, but also with all the tension that that entails as well. 
Germany wasn't like that at all. It had its Gastarbeiter, its guest workers, predominantly Turkish, some Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, um, but uh, either Middle Eastern or European as a rule. They had no rights. Uh, they were just residents until their residency permits were taken away and, and off they went. Um, that changed before Merkel. It was actually her predecessor, Gerhard Schroeder, who I think is quite a complicated and figure with a with a mixed record. Um, but he was the one who changed that. Um, and uh, this sort of bloodline idea, which is quite pernicious, um, the German way of looking at automatic rights to citizenship was uh, extended to people who had lived in the country, who had contributed to the country, the, the more normal as we understand its citizenship route. And so uh, that was the sort of legal environment. And then you look at what was happening. We all remember those horrific pictures, the, that little dead baby boy um, uh, on the beach, the extraordinary caravan of suffering um, that went on the tiny dinghies um, across the Mediterranean into Southern Italy, into the Greek islands and upwards. And everywhere they went in that period, the doors were slammed shut on them in the Balkans, in Hungary and Austria. And so they landed at Germany's door. Um, Merkel was quite slow to understand. She was dealing with the debt crisis at the time. She was quite slow to understand the importance of what was going on. But she immediately came to a view which is quite rare for her, which was just to act on impulse, um, that uh, we've got to let these, these people in. And uh, she said very pointedly, what do you expect I, a German, to do to build camps, question mark, with, with all that that word entails. Um, so she let them in. The initial uh, uh, reception was extraordinary. Opinion polls, uh, oh, sorry, surveys show that up to a half of all Germans did some form of helping or volunteering, whether it was just donating old clothes or, or different things like that, or whether it was actually helping in uh, temporary uh, shelters and, and food banks and places just to uh, get these people established. Uh, it was called the welcome culture um, and it absolutely was a new face of Germany. But then, as was inevitable, the atmosphere soured. People, particularly in small towns, particularly in places that themselves felt left behind, uh, and that was in particular, but not exclusively, the eastern states, the former GDR, where they already felt left behind once in terms of uh, psychologically, rather than economically, not being appreciated enough in the new Germany. Um, so the tensions grew, the AFD, the party of the far right, seized its opportunity. It was a pretty fringe, unremarkable party uh, to begin with. And its support went uh, through the roof up to 25, 30%, particularly in the Eastern states. And it was, and to a certain degree still is, uh, an alarming phenomenon. Um, I am cautiously optimistic that that party has hit the high watermark. Certainly recent regional elections and opinion polls uh, appear to demonstrate that. Probably also most countries, if they're given the opportunity in terms of the way your electoral system is uh, arranged, <clears throat> would probably you'll get 10 or 15 percent in pretty much every any country that would vote for a party of the far right. You'd probably get a similar number voting for a party of the far left, particularly in times of uncertainty. But again, what Merkel has managed to do, and she is a reflection of German society as much as she has been a safe harbor for it, is through a combination of a compassion, which isn't always synonymous with Germany, with an efficiency, which always is synonymous with Germany, to fuse those two, um, figures now are that up to a half of all that group of 2015 refugees have either got a job of sorts or training of sorts. Now, some of those jobs are will be, they call them mini jobs, sort of menial um, uh, work in which you're, you're paid by, by the hour, um, or they're in training. But I've met some pretty incredible cases. 
and Germany, like uh, other European countries, has been suffering a demographic problem with not enough people in the workplace. And so there was also a self-interest. And yeah, things are still difficult, but I really would defy anyone to A, offer an alternative. What was she supposed to do? You couldn't just leave a million people drifting. But so John, it's a, quite a problem that hasn't gone away. Are you suggesting that they should do it again or other nations in Europe should be doing the same on that kind of scale? No, they're not doing it. I mean, what's now is that after that, she went back to a more realpolitik approach, which was to cut a deal with Turkey's fairly unprepossessing leader, Erdogan, um, in which he keep, he's been keeping most of the refugees in Turkey. And as a result, that's a disincentive for people to, to flee their, uh, their country of origin in return for a shed load of money. Um, so, yeah, but I mean, still Germany takes in a lot more people in an annual quota each year than equivalent Western, Western countries do. And as you say, the migrant crisis is not going to go away, but it's also not going to go away if you just bury your head in the sand and say, just keep them away. There's nothing we, we can do about it. This is where uh, enlightened leadership and forward thinking it will never solve the problem, but it might help manage it. Right. There, there is so much in this book um, to talk about, and we, we're only going to get through the, the smallest amount of it. Um, but do start putting your questions in the Q&A box um, and we can talk about foreign policy and talk about the euro. Um, there's, there's tons of stuff to talk about. Um, German timekeeping. I'd love to. Ah, anecdotes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Lots of anecdotes. <laughs> I think you getting the, the, the a ticket for crossing for, uh, the zebra crossing, uh, the uh, not looking at the red man at four o'clock in the morning was pretty good. Um, yeah. I mean, I, it's funny. I find the, um, petty side of Germany harder to stomach than the big picture. I think most of the politics and all the stuff we've been talking about so far uh, is either tolerable or, or better and puts other countries to shame. But I mean, some of the rules, whether it's, as you say, I was in Bonn, which is quiet at the best of times, but at four o'clock in the morning, I can tell you it's pretty darn quiet, crossing a small road and a police car just happens to be driving along. Guy gives me a ticket. And I then say in sort of typically bolshy Brit style, don't be so ridiculous, you know, the next car's not going to come for three hours, which made things even worse. Almost like this sort of sense of, but rules are rules. Why on earth would you try to uh, relativize them or interpret them? They, they are what they are. And then there's the whole sort of social pressure as well, there's a sort of social pressure to conform and to be good. So, uh, and again, it's, it's a very difficult one because a lot of it is around environmentalism. And mm -hmm. we're seeing that now with COVID about being a good citizen. So when does being a good citizen impinge on your freedom and your individuality? And in Germany, back in the 80s, they were telling you what kind of garbage you put in this um, place here and what you did for recycling. And, Kind of concepts that were completely alien in Britain. There's one time when I, uh, one Sunday morning, I saw a beautifully embossed envelope on my battered little Volvo car um, and I opened and it was dear respected neighbour, blah blah blah, uh, would you please um, uh, clean your car as it's bringing down the reputation of the street. Um, you know, and I just thought, oh my God, get a life, you silly people. But on the other hand, it works. And yeah. it's also fairly sort of, it, it certainly wouldn't happen in hipster Berlin, I can tell you that. I, I hope my mother's watching. Um, she has uh, a, an Austrian, a lovely Austrian, Austrian neighbor who lives next door to her. And there's a repeated clash about what's done with the bins. So <laughs> that will ring true. Uh, but what, what really gets me is, I mean, you talk about um, the middle stance, you talk about the sort of family owned firms to the core to Germany's economic success. A lot's been you know, written about that. And um, it, it seems as an economic model to follow. But what really comes through in this book is how Germany has come to terms with its own history, not necessarily accepting it, but come to terms with it in some form of way and then being able to, to, to move forward. And the constitution is part of that. 
And I put that in contrast to, to Britain, where arguably, I don't think we've, um, I mean, th th this was um, said by uh, Dean Ash and uh, Jean Ash that, that um, Britain um, has lost an empire, but yet has yet to find a role for itself on the wall, and we still haven't done so. And, and that's the, I think, the key contrast that comes um, out in the book. So I want to sort of draw uh, a bit from the book, your conclusions about what's going on in the UK at the moment and why that's the case. It seems weird because one of my motivations to go back to your very first question, Nicholas, about why did I write it, was also the fact that you go into bookshops in most countries in the world, but certainly in the UK, and you look under the foreign, foreign or international section, and you look under Germany, and pretty much every book is about the First World War and the Second World War, and I wanted to write a book about contemporary Germany. But yet the war does loom large, and it looms large both there and here. And um, what do I mean by that? In uh, Britain, I believe we are paralyzed by the war. We're paralyzed by the past. We're paralyzed by past glory. We're paralyzed by what I would, what I call rule Britanniaism. In other words, everything is referenced back to uh, how we ruled the waves and how we still convince ourselves that we still do. What that is doing is removing rational, and it's absolutely found its apogee or its nadia, depending on your point of view and Boris Johnson and the people around him. Um, this idea that problems can be solved by nostalgia, can be solved by bumbling along, by um, uh, trying to make it up as you, as you go along, no codified constitution, look at it now with COVID and the complete mess that we've had. We have no idea of the relationship between the centre and the regions. Uh, on Brexit, Germans were shocked, not just by the result in June 2016, they were even more shocked by the idea that a supposedly sensible country could go into a referendum with only with one question and two possible answers and have no idea what to do if the other answer happened, as was the case. And the chaos that ensued, which in my view was not an accident, in my view it's a natural corollary of a um, make up and mend political system that is far beyond its sell by date. And I wrap that all into this idea that we are unable or unwilling to take a cold heart look at ourselves and say what works, what doesn't work, let's scrap this, let's do this, let's build a new constitution, let's start again, let's get all our systems in place ready for the 21st century. But Please. Germany, by contrast, because, the distinctions, because it can't look back, because it has no glories to refer back to, it's just pain, horror, self-loathing to a, to a large degree, confusion, bewilderment, it has to look forward. And it is absolutely wedded to the uh, codification, uh, the, you could call it a straitjacket, I would call it strong foundations of, of a constitution in which good rational decision-making and problem-solving rather than flag waving are at, at the heart of it. So both are actually still consequences of the war. Those two things I find are fascinating. The first thing is writing the basic law, the constitution upon which Germany is founded, the balance between the, the central government and the different states, and also ensuring that you've got you know, stable, generally coalition governments. <clears throat> That's one thing, and that gives Germany political stability. But the introspection, that was something that was avoided, wasn't it, John? I mean, you, you write about that. It really took um, 68 and then Willy Brandt um, going to Poland uh, and dropping to his knees to confront the history. Because much of that history, much of that introspect, they didn't want to look at themselves. They swept the history under the carpet deliberately in order to be able to carry on for a while. In order to rebuild, um, I don't believe... Um, and also just a, um, a set of traumas um, uh, that they were going through, because if you commit the horrors that Germany committed, um, and then you suffer a devastating defeat, as Richard von Weizsäcker, their president, um, 
said in the 80s, and I use the speech that he gave to Parliament as one of the great uh, caesura moments of um, uh, the, this whole question of, they call it Vergangenheits auf Arbeitung, sort of working through history. Um, and he was saying, and even in the 80s, it was interesting to say it, that total defeat was, was Germany's liberation. And it was, and, and, but it took time because the first generation were literally rebuilding the country and the allies pretty much stopped prosecutions fairly quickly after Nuremberg um, in order because they saw the new enemy, the Soviet Union and the divided country right on, on, uh, on their shoulders. Um, and it, as you say, Nicholas, it took the 1968, the, the left-wing revolutions and in America that was manifested through Vietnam, in Germany that too, but it was also saying to mummy and daddy, what did you do in the war? And finding out all kinds of things that had been buried. I would also go further to say, if you, if you take this, and I, I do identify these various stages in Germany's post-war history, 1949, the, the, the founding of the constitution, 1968, as mentioned, 1989, 90, the wall and unification, and the refugee crisis, each one marks a new development in Germany's development. And you could argue, actually, um, next year is going to be the 150th anniversary of the German Reich, of Bismarck, bringing the city-states together. They're not going to celebrate that or mark it at all. You could actually argue that what's happened this year, the 30th anniversary of this newly unified <clears throat> Germany, is actually you know, this Germany is only 30 years old. Yeah. Um, I was speaking to a, an Irish journalist in Dublin last year. No, it was an Irish senator, actually, uh, um, in the Irish parliament. And, and he was saying Britain's problem is that it didn't realise it actually lost the war, not won it. Um, and or, or won it and because of it has failed to have that period of introspection mm. that Germany and most other states in Europe have done, either due to occupation, dictatorship, um, you know, all, all the things that we haven't, um, that we haven't experienced. I'm going to bring in enough of me ranting on. Um, I want to uh, bring in other people's questions, questions yeah, now. Absolutely. Um, so uh, Marty Ryan, who's in the States, and then we've got Diane Cook, who's in the UK. So go ahead, Marty, you go ahead. Oh, John, this is fascinating. So um, you have partially answered this question, but um, what, how would you describe the psyche of the German people and, uh, and the difference between the psyche of the Germans and the psyche of the Brits or the Americans about, uh, that has allowed them to, um, I don't know if embrace is too strong a word, but has, has allowed them to follow the, the leadership of Angela Merkel in recent times in taking in refugees and and um, dealing with COVID. Well, hi, hi, Marty. Where are you in the states? I'm in Connecticut. Right. Hi. Um, you've got an interesting set of events coming up in two weeks' time. <laughs> um, oh, it's horrible! It's horrible! I can't wait for it to be over. And I can tell you before I answer your question that when. I talk to Germans about the next 12 months and German elections are next September, October. I say to them, by a factor of 10, the single most important elections taking place as far as Germany is concerned is the US elections. Um, if Trump wins again, God forbid, all bets will be off in terms of European stability. He loathes Merkel with a passion. There's something about her and it's easy to discern because she's sensible, she's grounded. She's generally polite. She knows her detail, all the things that Trump isn't and Trump detests. That and relationship she, and is she's poisonous. A woman. And she's a woman, absolutely. Um, and uh, the stuff he has said on the record, let alone what he says off the record in the locker room about her is extraordinary. And Germans are frightened stiff because for Germany, the, ah, there you are, I can see you. Um, for, for Germany, the modern Germany isn't about the flag. It isn't about national days and all the things that Americans, Brits, French and others associate with. It is about multinational 
multilateral institutions. It is about the rule of law. It is basically the, the 1945 Bretton Woods onward settlement. And the fact that that has been systematically undermined by Trump is more of a threat to Germans than it is even to Americans, uh, Brits and French who have other things to fall back on, the nation state and nation statism in a way that Germans don't. So to your question, I mean, it, it would be over claiming of me to uh, try to give you a, a sense. I think you need a, um, uh, a shrink to be able to get inside the German mind as it would about the American, British or any other mind. Um, there are uh, quite a lot of similarities, I would say, Brits, Germans and, and Americans. Uh, you know, I mean, in the uh, post-war uh, administration of West Germany, the Americans had the South and the Brits had uh, the sort of the North and the center parts and, and the French just had a small amount on the West. Um, and you can still tell it, you know, I was in Heidelberg just a few weeks ago and there's a sort of American thing about it as there is in Munich, as there is in Stuttgart and you go to the North and you, and this is what I love about Germany in a way similar to the, to the US, you just a very strong sense of regional and civic identity. Um, Britain and France, by contrast, I think are, are excessively centralized states. Um, uh, so you do get really uh, a very strong German affinity to America, although that is absolutely uh, lurches from one extreme to another, depending on who is president. John, do you think it's true that people are less, um, young, the younger generation, they're far less um, concerned about the Holocaust? That, that, I mean, I think there are Germans of my generation, I'm 50, who would volunteer that straight away. And as you said in your book, people would bring it up in conversation. But I think with younger Germans, they don't see that necessity anymore to talk about it. No, I disagree. I absolutely disagree. Um, they won't bring it up just because, <clears throat> you know, 75 years ago since the end of the war, and you know you struggle to to meet anybody on either side who you know who's who's had any meaningful uh, involvement in, as, either as a victim or as a perpetrator uh, in the war. Now that's just the natural passage of time. I absolutely um, think that Germany's war uh, legacy drives a huge amount. A lot of it is unspoken, but it does drive a lot, and it doesn't always drive it in the best sense. And this is actually where you could argue that US presidents, whether it's Trump or Obama, are, are right. That Germany has almost, or critics would say, Germany has used its war guilt not to participate in some of the difficult um, issues of the past. And of course, Germany's refusal to get involved in Iraq and Libya um, was hugely vindicated. But you also had the very difficult questions of what you do with the massacres in Kosovo um, and, and you, you see human rights abuses around the world. And some people talk um, about a pacifist nationalism of Germany, which is we are almost better than you because we don't get involved in military things. We don't get involved in the, the darker side of foreign policy. You know, we're kind of over that, we're beyond that. And actually my biggest challenge to Germany in this book is to say, if as I believe you are, with the demise of the United States, which I think will continue even if Biden wins, but it won't be so hysterical, the absolute demise of the UK, where is Western liberal democracy gonna look to for its both its moral light motifs, but also its uh, more interventionist, pragmatic uh, actions. Now, that's got to be to a large degree, but not on its own Germany. And that's time for you Germans to step up. And that's a very difficult and threatening uh, exhortation to Germany. I don't think I've answered your question. I've just meandered. But, right. Um, <laughs> We're going to take, um, uh, we've got more questions lining up here, so we need to uh, move, move on. on, but I think we've got uh, some answer there anyway. Um, we're going to take Diane Cook in a second. I'm just going to sort of intersperse this. You, you talked about the demise, of the absolute demise of the UK, um, John, 
Um, do, do you think the UK will exist within the next decade? Do you think we're bound uh, to break up? And if so, why? And also, Diane, please ask your question at the same time so we can link those two together. Diane. So I won't answer it. So do you want me to go first? Yeah, yeah, go on. You, yeah. you, you link your question to that. Um, I mean, there's so much you're saying that I, I agree with or, or recognise. Um, but campaigning in the last general election, I came across a woman under the age of 40 who um, was very confused actually. But uh, one of the things she came out with was that people had died in the trenches for women's votes. And so my question was really about why the British are, that's an anecdote to illustrate it, why the British, particularly young people under say the age of 40 or 50, who have absolutely no direct experience. I don't have a direct experience of the, the Second World War. So long ago, why are they so nostalgic for something they, they, they just don't know about? You tell me. Uh, I, I mean, um, it's uh, if you look at the first lockdown that we had this spring, what was the one event that the government agreed, and it was hugely popular, that an exception should be made. It was VE Day celebrations. Yes. Now I'm, you know, I am. I, you know, I like to think I'm. I mean, I, I see myself as a global citizen, but I'm a British citizen, and I'm a proud Brit. Uh, and you know, without British sacrifice in the war, we wouldn't be here. My father's Jewish. He he uh, fled Bratislava um, and then worked uh, as a doctor for the British Army, and and then and then in London. I mean. That is a that is a Britain and a British war um, legacy and effort that should never be qualified or underestimated. But at the same time, it shouldn't dictate everything that we do, and it does. And yeah, I and see sorry, that. Sorry to cut across, but also, yeah. be you find children of ten or yeah. eight absolutely, uh, you know awash with all this yeah. stuff. well it's school i mean it's it's school curricula but i do think more psychologically although i wouldn't claim to have any great psychological uh insight into any country i do think it's balm you know it's applying soothing ointment mm. to our current woes we don't know who we are to so your question nicholas will the uk survive the four constituents i mean well, Spain has obviously been in the throes of a very violent and, and heavy handed um, set of responses to that. Um, I mean, the UK doesn't even know what its regions are for. It doesn't know what its what its nations are for. And again, we should be upfront and say, this is an opportunity to modernize. Tony Blair flirted with that modernization, but amazing to, you know, he had a majority of 179 and he did so little in that area. Uh, ha and we're clearly not gonna get any change out of this lot. This is just a, um, an awful return to, uh, to nostalgia. But I fear, Diane, that the worse it gets here in terms of economic inequality, regional underrepresentation, the absolute catastrophe that Brexit will produce, both psychologically but also economically, the worse it gets, the more of this kind of uh, extreme nostalgia we're going to indulge in. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Jim Lernstein, is Jim there? I'm hoping Jim is there. Maybe, yeah, Jim, jo can go ahead, Jim, go on. Um, well, I'm an ex-diplomat, so I'm going to ask the obvious question. Uh, how lasting do you think the damage is that Trump has done to German-American relations? In other words, if Biden is elected, uh, do you think we will uh, be able to partially restore the relationship we had with Germany? That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, to what extent has the AFD of uh, uh, profited by uh, the fact that uh, there is this populist government in the United States today. Um, hi, Jim. Yeah, two good questions. I mean, uh, the on the first one, um, I, you, you used uh, a word that I'll borrow partially. Um, the part of this is a long-term trend, and. 
Barack Obama, who also had quite a complicated relationship with Merkel. That wasn't just a complete love-in. Um, the Americans were spying on her mobile phone um, for all the time she was chancellor. And she absolutely, in a very rare occasion, because she has total impulse control, she, on one occasion, she just completely lost her temper with Obama and said, this isn't East Germany, you, you shouldn't be acting like the Stasi, what are you doing? Uh, and they had a complicated relationship. Uh, she didn't like his sort of, she called it ultra charisma because she doesn't have it. Um, and so it's always been uh, a, a difficult, slightly touchy and touchy re relationship. Uh, but obviously under um, Trump, uh, it just went off the scale. But I mean, a lot of these things are, long term. The American pivot away from Europe is long term. The American focus on China is, is long term. Uh, trade relations are going to be uh, difficult. American demands on Iran are not going to necessarily uh, change overnight and Biden will uh, not be this sort of hallelujah moment for relations with Germany. And yet at the same time, it will be bringing America back into the mainstream of behavior. Um, it will just be a kind of normal set of interactions, uh, which I think given uh, what it's been, um, will be a blessed relief for all, for all concerned. As to the AFD, yeah, I mean, uh, but it's not just the AFD, it's all um, populist and far right and far left. Uh, I mean, they've all been um, given sucker by um, Trump, but also by Putin in a different way, who has funded uh, separatist movements, far right movements, mm. far left movements, uh, computer hacking, um, the uh, removal, if that is what is going to happen, and if he actually leaves, of Trump, I would say in reverse, might take the wind out of the sails, hopefully, um, of uh, some of these movements in um, uh, in Europe and elsewhere, but you know they still have, and after Trump there will still be Trumpism, and Trump Mark II will appear, uh, I suspect. But you Americans will have a better handle on, on that than me. Okay, um, let's take um, Simon Jackson, uh, and then um, I can see Yuri Vint in front of me as well. So Simon, go ahead, and then Yuri. Simon. Hello, it's Annie. Annie disguised as Simon. Simon disguised as Annie, sorry. Um, there is an interesting article in the Times today uh, uh, about a study showing that millennials all over the world have lost faith in democracy. Now, it is po it's pointed out that this trend is most pronounced in what they call the Anglo-Saxon democracies, the US, UK, and Australia. But I'm curious to know if uh, you see the same thing amongst German millennials. Um, it's interesting. I, I haven't seen anything um, that breaks it down generation to generation. In other words, boomers and, and um, Gen Xers and, and millennials and Gen Zers. Um, uh, there is absolutely a regional disparity in Germany. East Germans have far less, um, uh, feel far less allegiance towards democratic norms than uh, uh, West Germans do. That's a, that's a gross oversimplification, but that is what the polls show. What is interesting, uh, to go back to the Russia-China point, uh, is that um, a lot of opinion polls show um, a sense of allegiance that Germans feel to the West and to NATO um, is far less secure um, than it otherwise might be. And that's partly been um, uh, accelerated uh, in the age of Trump, but it's always been there as well. And that is one of the sides of Germany that, that worries me most, a sort of slight sense of moral equivalence between America on one side and, and Russia on the other. But as to the surveys, that, that you, the survey that you point to, uh, US, UK and Australia, yeah, I mean, um, the answer is, uh, is, 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 is well known, although the roots, you can always wonder whether people like Trump and Johnson are the causes of our malaise or just a manifestation of a much bigger, uh, much deeper malaise. I'm conscious we've only got 15 minutes left, so I'm gonna speed everyone up on their questions and possibly John on the, on the answers as mm. well. Yuri Vint, also a question about the AFD. 
um, and the relationship with um, the, the, the cause of the problem within, um, is that related to former East German areas? Yuri, you go ahead and say it. So at the heart of the, um, the point I, I was trying to get at is um, your contention on how Germany has reconciled uh, with its history in the past. And the question is whether, you know, neo-fascism could, fascism and neo-fascism could rise again. And, um, and, uh, uh, and how sound that reconciliation of the past is. So there's an issue of the AFD. There's also an issue of uh, right-wing infrastructure within the armed services that's recently um, uh, been exposed. Okay, you're then, I'm gonna, I'm, John, if you can answer that question. Yeah, uh, there's been... Uh, I think, I'm just going to add the, the recent attack on synagogues as well. Yeah. Um, and whether there's a fusion of that. Yeah. Um, there was, there's a lot of stuff at the moment about police, the infiltration of the police by far-right groups, WhatsApp groups, um, doing some pretty horrific stuff. Um, yeah, that that is uh, an issue. Terrorism, I would say without making light of it, I don't see that as a particular soft underbelly of Germany that's happening everywhere. Um, whether it's far-right terrorism, whether it's Islamist terrorism, um, uh, stroke anti-Semitic terrorism, uh, I see those as, as global phenomena. But it's interesting, a lot of Germans uh, talk about the Zonderweg, the special path, which is certainly not a positive term. It basically means, do Ger they ask themselves, do we as Germans have a special dispense, a special uh, route to, um, uh, to horror? Are, is there something sort of genetic, uh, societal, behavioural about us that leads us to do terrible things? I, I'm fascinated by that, and I'm fascinated by how many Germans, including the young, think that. And one of the reasons that rules are rules and they have to be obeyed is the fear that if you don't obey these rules that are designed to help the weak against the strong and designed to help the community against the rampaging individual, everything, the whole deck of cards will, will, will collapse and we Germans will just get back up to our uh, bad old days. I find that a really problematic formulation. I think, um, and this is a terrible counterfactual, but I, um, I do not think there was a special dispensation of Germans towards fascism or Nazism. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I mean, there was such a global or European phenomenon. And certainly now, I think there is as much chance of it happening anywhere else, possibly more chance of it anywhere else, simply because Germans are so exercised by the possibility of, of terrible things being uh, happening uh, in their name. Does that mean that there is a bedrock of many tens of thousands of people who might be planning terrible things or in the police or the army or anywhere in society who look at terrible websites and have terrible thoughts. No, I'm not saying that doesn't exist either. I just think the societal and state structures are strong enough to make sure that doesn't happen. Okay, Nigel Harley, question about the economy and German economic model. Nigel. Um, yes, I really want to know a um, view on how sustainable the present model is because Clearly, I mean, nobody has benefited more from the euro than the Germans. I mean, one, it's been almost disproportionate the amount that they have benefited from it. And also, um, there are big changes coming along, particularly in the car industry, which obviously yeah. is great, hugely important to Germany. And how well you feel that uh, Germany will be able to um, really cope with these changes. And well, John talks your... a lot about the car industry. In yeah, a so I mean, fascinating set of questions, Nigel, yeah. and Nicholas's strictures for me to keep it brief, um, uh, make it hard to answer uh, uh, this very well. Um, on the car industry, uh, yeah, I mean, it's extraordinary how they were caught asleep um, at the wheel, the Germans, in terms of uh, electrification and modernization of the car industry. I mean, autonomous vehicles are maybe over, uh, over anticipated, but certainly, you know, hybrid electrification, Germany, uh, was absolutely caught caught asleep by Tesla and by uh, the Japanese and by others. They're catching up fast, but it was. Um, but then you have, I think, another interesting uh, point uh, around this is corporate governance. And you had the VW emission scandal. You've had Wirecard mm -hmm. recently, and there's a rottenness at the heart of corporate governance. And 
actually Lionel Barber, the former editor of the FT, a good friend of mine who reviewed my book for The Spectator, uh, was very nice about it, but he took issue very strongly with me and just said, I've gone too easy on corporate governance. I think my book went to bed before Wirecard came out, but I think he's got a point and I'm going to beef up that section in the updated um, paperback because I do think there's a problem there. There's also a problem generally, this langsam aber sicher, slow but sure approach, which has served Germany so well in so many ways, as I hope I've, I've described, is also its Achilles heel when it comes to flexible, modern and high tech. Yeah um economy um and in terms of you know i mean german 4g speeds are slower than albania's um you know i mean germany is quite behind it's still a cash society which has been really problematic in covid times there's a lot of catching up to do the uh, i would just say the sort of analogy i always think with germany is that whenever you think they're the sick man of europe and everybody else is about to overtake them they do catch up and then because they're so thorough and they're such perfectionists, they always tend to, to sort of catch up and overtake at the same time. So I don't think, uh, I think the car industry will, um, and there's such a co uh, contradiction at the heart of Germany's very strong green movement, strong green party, environmentalists since before I was born, at the same time, their obsession with the car and driving at crazy speeds without speed limits on, on the autobahns. Um, uh, but I think they uh, they they are catching up on a lot of this digital stuff and on the electrification but stuff. John, the suggestion I think also in Nigel's question is it weren't if it weren't for the euro, Germany wouldn't oh, yes. be nearly as well in terms of exports as yeah. it is. And perhaps that the suggestion possibly there is also that the Mittelstand uh, the their importance are exaggerated, and really it's just the euro that's given the German economy the edge. Uh, yeah, I mean to a degree that's the case. On the other hand, Germany has given the European Union the stability and the and the fiscal and the monetary stability mm. without which yeah. uh, it wouldn't exist. So it's, that's two sides of the same coin. I would say the bigger threat to the German export-oriented economy is the freezing of relations with China. Because Germany always thought, as soon as Deng Xiaoping opened up China, Germany went straight in. It was China was the gift that kept on giving, you know, just sell everything to the Chinese. <clears throat> the Chinese love German models, but also the sort of infrastructure stuff, their machine tools, their all their sort of high end engineering. Germany absolutely dominated international exports into China. Now that both China has sort of uh, caught up or stolen everybody's IP stroke uh, trade barriers, stroke very cold relations with the West. That is an area where a lot of German companies have overexposed themselves to China and diversification is the new watchword in corporate Germany. Yeah, and also you're talking about your book and, and trying to protect um, areas which the, the state believes that um, it wouldn't be advisable for China to be buying up companies and having too much influence. And Huawei is, uh, is yeah. the, the issue that everybody else wrestles with. Hilary Matthews, let's take your question, Hilary. Yeah, can there you hear go, me? Yeah. yeah. Um, Yes, I just thought in the light of what you've been saying, uh, you said that Merkel is, I just wondered, there was a quote in the Guardian from uh, Saturday's Guardian that said her attempt to curb COVID infections in Germany is being frustrated by local resistance. And apparently they have had a sudden increase like the rest of us have. Wave two is coming hard and fast in Germany. And I wondered about whether you think that she will last until the end of her term in view of the uh, some opposition she's getting from local, the, the count, the, uh, what are they called, mm -hmm. the federal states? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Hillary, if I was going to, God forbid, uh, applies to anybody, if I was going to fall ill with COVID, I'd much rather it happen in Germany than it, than it does in the UK. <clears throat> the level of planning, of bed capacity, of health provision, of equipment. I was in this um, only two weeks ago in a quite an impoverished post-industrial town of Duisburg. And I was gobsmacked by the testing facilities. There were no queues. Everybody could get tested, track and trace works. Um, yes, it's Germany. De it's decentralized, John. That's one of the key things, isn't yes. it? Yes. And it's by and large working, but yes, there, you know, there's been resistance. The 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 16 lender, she actually doesn't have very much power um, when it comes uh, health education and other areas are devolved to the to the regions. 
by and large, it's worked. But yes, there are frictions about restrictions. There are inconsistencies. Berlin is the center of the donut. The region of Brandenburg is all the way around it. And they have completely different uh, sort of tier models at the moment. And that's not really um, working. So there are all kinds of uh, issues. But again, even though there's been differences of views, it's nothing like the brinkmanship that's going on here between the centre and Manchester and regional leaders claim, you know, claiming that they've or saying that they've never been consulted by the government invoking new uh, restrictions in, in all manner of regions in this country. Uh, the total, I think it's not too so strong a word, chaos of Britain's uh, first and second wave COVID response um, is very different to Germany's. Yes, they're going through, I got back from Berlin, what was it, 12 days ago, and the sort of two or three days before I left, the atmosphere was definitely deteriorating. Meetings were being cancelled, people were kind of leaving their offices again and going back home. But the deterioration and the rise in cases and hospitalizations are minuscule compared to Britain's. And I say this without any sort of uh, sense of uh, schadenfreude or anything. I think it is tragic, but unsurprising, uh, given both the structural problems that British governance has, but also the lack of uh, any form of competence among our senior ministers. And that's not an anti-conservative view. I would never have said that about previous conservative administrations. Um, means that Britain's COVID death rate crisis was, I'm afraid, utterly predictable. Uh, I want to draw you out on that a bit more. Um, what what is the problem in terms of if you're talking we we know we do have a written constitution it's just one that's written again and again it's up to parliament what to to make the laws yeah. as they, as they go along um what how how do you think um the union is possible to save at the moment we had a um a constitutional historian um uh, with us recently and he was saying it's gone scotland has gone you know if there's a referendum anytime soon they're going to vote to leave the union is over yeah well, I, th I think that's the i mean i think that's absolutely the case and that's why johnson will seek to ensure that it doesn't have one uh and you know uh, heaven forbid we will get into a Catalan situation. And of course, uh, we won't, because uh, Nicola Sturgeon and, and others won't, won't do that. And Johnson and others, for all their faults, won't do that either. But it is absolutely um, uh, creaking at the seams. Um, and again, this is an absolute perfect opportunity, as we should have had immediately after the Brexit referendum, for what the Germans just couldn't understand was, you vote for Brexit, you have no idea what you're doing next. Right, why not have an all-party royal commission? You work out this, you work out that, you work out what your broad brush demands are, what your negotiating positions are, uh, customs union, um, uh, all the different freedoms of, of Europe. Then you report to Parliament, Parliament debates it, then you invoke Article 50, then you have the negotiation. This all seems so logical, why didn't we do it? Well, because it's Britain and it's bombast and it's binary politics and someone wins and, and someone loses. And, you know, the same uh, with regard to a new constitutional settlement for the nations. I mean, you look at COVID, you know, Wales, much less strident than Scotland, has invoked its own national firebreak uh, for the next uh, two and a half to three weeks. That's an entirely different form of politics, right or wrong. Um, to England. So you all, you, even with Wales, you have an almost a complete sense, with the exception of defence and foreign policy, of separation now. So it is time, instead of trying to patch it up as we go along, to have a proper debate uh, and settlement over, over the future of the Union. And we could have some federation. That's not beyond the, the realms of, of possibility. It would seem to me it comes back to Diane Cook's question about really about who we are and at the moment still being defined by nostalgia, this weight of this imperial history that has given us such a strong identity in the world precludes a debate about what we should be and where we're going now in future. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, John. It's been a really, really interesting discussion. 
I'm just going to hold up his book again. Um, it's it's a great read. Uh, I'm I have not managed to read all of it yet. I've had to speed read some of it to my regret, but I've really really enjoyed it so far, and I'm going to carry on doing so. So thank you very much indeed, John.